webinar. Uh, we have a few more people joining, so we will begin um, in about two minutes. Thank you. Today's webinar, Supporting and Evaluating School Counseling that Promotes School Success. My name is Kimberly Simmons, and I am the Educator Evaluation Coordinator for North Carolina, and I am joined today by Cynthia Floyd, the School Counseling Consultant for DPI. We also have our colleague, Delia Payne, with us today to assist. Before we begin our presentation, let's address some webinar logistics and norms. Here you um, see a clip of what your screen should look like. Can you hear the presenter? And if you can, would you please raise your hand to let us know that you can clearly hear us. Okay. Again, if you can hear us, please raise your hand. Thank you. If you can see the presentation screen, if you would please raise your hand just to let us know that our visuals are accurate and available. Thank you so much. See lots of hands going up. As a reminder, there is a questions area during this webinar and you may enter your questions at any time and Delia and I will try to um, answer those questions or provide those questions to Cynthia Floyd so she can answer them for us if they are about the school counselor's um, evaluation. Also, we do have documents uh, handout and um, Cynthia will go over that as we progress through the presentation. And there is also a chat link where we may provide web links and other information. Uh, we may post it there for you to access. So at this time, um, I will turn the content delivery over to Cynthia Floyd. Thank you, Cynthia, for being with us today to share your insight and your expertise regarding the school counseling role. And yes, let me go over the webinar norms. Thank you so much. Uh, we do ask during this webinar that you minimize your outside distractions. We ask that you also notify the presenter if you are having technical difficulties, and if you'll do that by raising your hand or providing us a note in the questions bar. We also ask that you use the questions bar on your dashboard to ask any questions that you have. And we will be happy to um, respond with answers to those questions or take note of those questions and um, answer them in a follow-up email after the presentation today. So again, I'll turn it over to Cynthia Floyd at this time. And thank you, thank you, thank you, Cynthia, for joining us today and um, sharing with us the content for this webinar. Thank you so much, Kim, and thank you, Delia, to both of you for um, helping and setting this up. <clears throat> I will be doing this with a cough drop. I hope that won't be too distracting. Um, greatly appreciate Delia and Kim's support, as I told them just a few moments ago. It confuses me when I have help. You, I know you all know what that's like. We do a lot on our own, and I appreciate their assistance, and appreciate all of you for joining us today. Our webinar uh, outcome objectives are to help increase your understanding and effective utilization of your school counselors and their comprehensive school counseling programs in order to best support student success through our professional standards and evaluation. And we're going to do that by just reviewing some content, having some sample evaluation activities and other types of activities, and identifying some resources for you that you can utilize beyond today to assist you. I know you're probably already familiar with the evaluation process. The good news, we're not going to be covering that this afternoon. I know you, most of you have probably heard this a million times. The counselor evaluation process is the same as with your other staff, the same steps. Um, since we won't be reviewing that today, if anyone does want to look more in detail at that, you can find it on the NESIS wiki space. Uh, you'll need to scroll down and click on the support staff link and you'll find lots of resources for all your various support staff there. So if you need more about the process for evaluation, uh, that's where you can find that information. <clears throat> um, Kim mentioned a handout. The handout is the actual evaluation rubric. So if you could take a mo moment to look over on the right, you'll see a place for handouts so that you can open that up. We're going to be utilizing that in a few minutes. I want you to be able to glance at that whenever you might need to as we 
talk about some of the things we would want our school counselors doing and the things that you might be evaluating. So that is the only handout that we have for today. So when we think about those standards on that evaluation rubric, what difference does it make if school counselors are even following those standards? And basically it's that it's not about the school counselors, it's about the students. So those standards are about how, what do we need to do to help students be most successful? Same as with your school improvement plans. We're, it, everything we're planning and what we want counselors doing is about helping students be more successful. And the school counselor professional standards are designed to help counselors implement counseling strategies that are effective in supporting student success. And that is why we've aligned our standards with the national standards for school counselors with the American School Counselor Association national model. Those standards are evidence and research based to promote student academic, career, and social emotional success. Um, and the American School Counselor Association continues to do research on effective practices in school counseling. A matter of fact, they granted six um, research award grant awards this year, and two of those grants came to North Carolina. So UNC Pembroke and UNC Charlotte, uh, excuse me, Chapel Hill, are both doing research this school year on effective practices of school counseling. And we deliberately try to align our standards and best practice recommendations with what data is saying works for students. This is kind of the framework for the American School Counselor Association national model. So this also gives you kind of a graphic of what our state standards would look like and also general statute 115C 316.1, which is the duties of school counselors law. Um, all of these basically say that you want the school counselor spending the majority of their time, about 80% of their time, providing services that impact students, so counseling services. Um, in the national model, those services are called direct and indirect. In our state legislation, they're all called direct. Um, but basically, these are services that the counselor is doing directly with students or for students. So they might be doing direct uh, classroom guidance or academic advising or small groups with students, various activities. The indirect might be things like um, they're doing a parent night or something like that. The rest of the time, which actually makes up most of the graphic, but it's the smallest amount of time, is in their collaborating with other folks, the foundation, look, deciding what their focus of the school counseling program will be, looking at your school's data to make sure that what they're planning is really what your students need and managing that school counseling program and then looking back at the data to see if what they did made a difference. Um, also embedded in that is what we call fair share. But as you well know, there are some things that it takes every warm body in your building to pull it off. Uh, things like committees, probably everybody on your school staff is on a committee. Uh, counselors can do that too. Um, it takes every warm body we have in a school plus the parents and volunteers we pull in to pull off testing weeks. So uh, that's something that counselors can also assist with. The general statute does say that they can't be the ones coordinating testing, and the purpose for that was to try to keep counselor time from being monopolized by testing coordination so that they do have time to deliver those services. So what does the data tell us as far as does it make any difference if counselors are doing these things? So I wanted to share just one snapshot of data with you from North Carolina. This is Paige Fister. She is the North Carolina School Counselor of the Year. She's at Friendship Elementary in Davison County. And this is the data from her school. Um, in order to get School Counselor of the Year, it, it's a pretty extensive application process. Um, they have to show the proof that they're implementing our state standards and the ASCA national model. And that is a very comprehensive approach in that they have to be collaborating with everyone in the school. It's not just the school counselor are doing it, but they're collaborating with the other school. So as you can see from this example data, we tend to see good school data and student success from schools that are following the standards and the counselors are working hard to implement that comprehensive school counseling program. So what does it take to be someone who can be hired to implement that comprehensive school counseling program? So as you see here, I've got three options for you. So in North Carolina, one has to get a master's degree to be a school counselor. Now there are provisional ways of, if you have a master's in a different area of counseling, you can take additional courses. But in general, a master's degree in school counseling typically, typically requires 
And which one do you think is the correct answer? 26 to 38 graduate semester hours, 34 to 46, or 48 to 60? Now I'm going to launch a poll so that you can enter what you think is the correct answer. And we'll see how that turns out. So select which answer you think is correct. We're going to give you just a little bit of time to do that. Okay, if you haven't entered it, do it quickly. I'm getting ready to close the poll and see what kind of result we got. 83% of you are correct. 83% said 48 to 60 graduate semester hours. And you're absolutely correct. It is the 48 to 60 graduate semester hours. Um, that's pretty extensive. Some folks are surprised to find that out. So school counselors get a lot of training to become a school counselor. Um, we're going to see more and more programs going to the 60 hours as the National KCREP Association that accredits counseling graduate programs is about to require 60 hours. So they're getting a lot of training in order to implement that um, comprehensive model in your school to support student success. So what does the comprehensive program look like? These are the key factors to look for in your school counselor's program. Uh, are they making data-driven decisions? Or are they just doing random acts of, of guidance or something? Or are they actually looking at your school's data and seeing that maybe you have a bullying problem? Uh, maybe you have a dropout problem. Um, you may have had a lot of students uh, lose a family member and need to deal with their grief. So is your school counselor looking at the data to decide what should be in their school counseling program? Is their program comprehensive, preventive, and developmental? So comprehensive looking at all the potential needs, preventive, and that we're not waiting for the problem to happen. So rather than waiting for a bunch of kids to have conflicts, the school counselor may be teaching conflict resolution to kids. Uh, developmental, um, I know we have an array of levels of administrators with us today, so naturally you're not going to see the same thing going on in an elementary program that you would in a middle school program versus a high school program. And that's one of the things we like about our standards and the ASCA national model is that it is very open to personalizing based on your school's needs and developmental level. Um, it should also be looking at equity and access for every student. So the counselor might not be working with every single student individually, but somehow every student is benefiting from the counseling program, whether it's in groups or something they're doing school-wide. Somehow every student is benefiting from the school counseling program, not the old guidance counselor programs of the past, but the school counselor programs of today, whereas it used to be only the kids that got in trouble or the kids that were bound for college got help from, the, from a counselor years ago, whereas now we want all students to benefit from the counseling program. Also, um, promoting student achievement for career and college readiness. So even elementary, how are they getting kids ready for thinking about career and college readiness? On up through middle and high school, what are they doing to help students get ready for career and college readiness? And the counselors should be constantly kind of evaluating what's working, what's not working, looking to improve, and being accountable to their stakeholders to make sure that things really are making a difference for students. And that is the primary question to answer for a school counseling program. How are students better off as a result of the school counseling program? So it's not about what is the counselor doing, how are they spending their time specifically, or is the schedule working? It is what is the counselor doing that's resulting in students being better off as a result of the services that they're providing? So we're going to go through the standards, and of course we're going to do this fairly quickly since we don't have a lot of time, but don't worry, we're going to end with sharing resources with you. But going to go through the standards from a different perspective than uh, we have in previous webinars, and that you're going to have questions that you can ask, you know, is my counselor doing this? So for counselors demonstrating leadership, advocacy, and collaboration, and, and feel free to glance over at the handout if it helps you, these are some of the questions you might ask regarding this first standard. Is your counselor working collaboratively with other staff to create a positive learning community? Are they taking an active role in looking at local, state, and or national data to develop and enhance their, enhance their counseling program? 
are they creating data-driven goals and strategies? Again, we don't want them just doing random things. We want them looking at your school improvement plan and, and making goals that are appropriate for school counseling that also support the goals uh, that are in your school improvement plan and implementing counseling strategies that do that. Um, are they discussing their program with you? They should at least at the beginning of the school year talk about what they want to accomplish in the school counseling program, ask you what kind of goals that you think they should be working on, and, and uh, preferably have all of this written down in an annual agreement talk, talking about what you think the counseling program should include each year. And <clears throat> providing input into professional development because, you know, they see the teachers and collaborate with the teachers all the time. They might hear some of the concerns teachers have. It helps them identify uh, what professional development that staff might need. And they, they can consult with you to help with that. And, and also looking at what professional development they themselves need to foster their own professional growth. Um, continuing with standard one, always looking to improve school counseling and contributing to that positive school climate that we mentioned. Um, advocating for positive changes in policies and practice as they affect student learning, uh, promoting awareness of the responsiveness to learning styles and cultural diversity and individual learning needs. Uh, does your counselor collaborate with staff in building relationships with students? And we've often heard the phrase of kids don't care what you know until they know you care. So those relationships can be critical and counselors can help with that and always doing so with high ethical standards. So, I'm going to give an example. We, one of the things we mentioned was aligning with your school improvement plan. So below is a sample, on the screen is a sample school improvement plan goal. And I want you to read this goal and then decide which one do you think would be the most appropriate and effective strategy for a school counselor in supporting the goal that you see there on the screen. And we're going to switch this, this to the poll mode. It'll be worded a little bit differently in the poll because it has a limit to the number of characters. I'm going to switch to the poll mode so you can indicate what you think is the best option. So I'll give everyone a few more seconds to log in your vote. So if you haven't entered yours yet, if you could hurry up and do so, because we're getting ready to close the poll. Okay, 91% of you said B. The school council provides small group sessions on organizational and test-taking schools for students. And you're exactly right, because the counselor's role is to remove barriers to student learning. So if you have students that are not doing well on integrate because they're disorganized or they don't have good test-taking skills, this is an excellent way to utilize your school counselor. Now, I know putting them in that rotation can be very tempting to make the schedule work. However, that's not about student needs. That's about schedule needs. And you really want your counselors to be able to join those teachers during their planning time also so that they can talk about integration across curriculum and which students might need to be in those small group sessions. So that one wouldn't have been the correct answer. And also um, C, tutoring. We, many counselors do not even have an uh, undergraduate degree in education or not trained as teachers. And if they're spending their time providing tutoring, they won't have sufficient time to do things like these small group sessions to help students with the organizational and test taking skills. So they might be in the planning time with the teachers talking about, okay, who's struggling, who doesn't have the good organizational skills and test taking skills, and how can I as a school counselor help with those students? And then the counselor works with those students and the teachers do the teaching. So yeah, it looks like the large majority of you, 91%, got that one correct. So we'll go on to the next item. And we'll move on to standard two. So here are some questions that you can ask 
your school counselor or just ask of the counseling program to see if they're meeting standard two. And these are just a few examples. There's a, there are a lot more out there. You know, are they doing things to create an environment that is inviting and respectful and supportive and inclusive? Um, are they modeling and teaching behaviors that lead to positive and nurturing relationships through developmentally appropriate and prevention-oriented activities? Are they actively seeking materials and developing activities that counteract stereotypes and incorporate the histories and contributions of diverse populations? Uh, one example I've seen a lot of school counselors do with this is when they have a career day, they make a point to make sure they've got some stereotypes counteracted. Uh, so often we think of men as doctors. They might have female doctors there, for example. So different ways to counteract those stereotypes in the work that they're doing. Uh, we've seen teachers do the same thing with um, textbooks and, and books that they read with students and making sure that there's diversity represented. Um, recognizing the influence of culture on child's development and personality. Uh, does your counselor help others understand how that culture and language and background might be influencing what's going on in the classroom and helping others respect that diversity? And are they maintaining high expectations, including graduation from, graduation from high school, excuse me, for students of all backgrounds? So we want to make sure that our counselors are doing that. A little bit more on standard two. Uh, are they collaborating with school and community personnel to meet student needs? Are they identifying student needs using data or referrals or observations and other sources of information? Collaborating with others to create customized plans of action, so, such as that's another example of good planning time with the teachers. What are they doing to improve communication and collaboration among the school, the home, and the community in order to build that trust with your parents? I had the pleasure of visiting a, a school recently that had a, a great climate for collaboration um, and the parents just had nothing but good things to say as far as the climate of feeling welcome at that school. So how do your counselors help make that happen? So as, before we get into the next activity, because we're going to do an evaluation with standard two, I want to remind you what the evaluation ratings are and, um, and you're also going to need that handout for this next activity. You're probably very familiar with these ratings. So we're going to have an actual scenario of a school counselor in a school. So I want you to take a minute to read this scenario about Ms. Thompson, the school counselor. And just in relation to standard two, read this scenario and think about how would you rate Ms. Thompson on standard two. So I'm going to give you about a minute to, to read over this and, and a couple minutes and to look over the evaluation rubric and then we'll discuss it. So a little bit of silent time for your reading. Okay, let's think about how we would rate Ms. Thomason. Wouldn't we all love to have Ms. Thomason in our schools? I hope some of you have a Ms. Thomason. She is awesome. She's collaborating with the school staff regarding climate and she's assisting with curriculum integration of Character Ed and PBIS. She's sharing data and program outcomes with stakeholders. Um, using data for assessment and her planning, so she's doing the data-driven decision-making, communicating high expectations for all of the students, and she's making very deliberate efforts to select those materials that are counteracting 
uh, stereotypes, embracing diversity, and revising the program as she goes along to meet the student needs, doing a lot of the sharing and communicating and collaborating effective practices, not just at the school level, she's also doing it at the district level, and it was so well received, uh, she was supported to go do it at the state conference, so she did a little bit of professional development in there too. And she's advocating for students on multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary teams within the school and the district. So this particular counselor is doing an awesome job at standard two. So I wanted to give you an example of a really awesome counselor to see all the things that a counselor could be doing related to standard two. Again, that is just an example. So let's move on to standard three. Counselors understanding and facilitating the implementation of a comprehensive school counseling program. This is where a lot of your counselor's time is going. Uh, there's a little bit of overlap across the different standards, but this one truly gets to the meat of the counseling program, this one and, and standard four also, really get to what they're implementing. So one of the, some of the things you'll be looking for is, is your school counselor supporting equity and access to rigorous and relevant curricula for all students, uh, including aligning the strategy, their strategies with standard course of study? So for example, high school counselor, you may have some students that historically may not have been well represented in some honors classes. They might be working to see if they can get more representation from that group of students. Or students that are kind of on the cutoff line, they might or might not be able to handle honors and the counselor and the teacher really believe they could. So they're really supporting those students getting into those courses. Uh, developing and applying strategies that enhance student success. So looking at, at what your counselor is doing, what are they doing to enhance student success? And they should have lots of understanding of human development and student learning and academic success. So how are they applying that knowledge to address the academic career and personal social development of all students? Do they understand how the comprehensive school counseling program relates to other disciplines? We don't want the counselor doing everything they're doing in isolation. That's why it's important for them to have conversations with the teachers. How can what they're implementing reflect what the teachers are teaching in the classroom and vice versa? Um, supporting teachers and other specialists on the use of standard course of study as we look at how to integrate uh, 21st century life skills into what students are learning. Uh, using data, you're going to see using data repeatedly throughout the school counselor standards and evaluation. And being very deliberate and strategic and broadly incorporating into their program those life skills that students need. Uh, we often hear from the business community that, yeah, we get students that can read and write and do math and they don't know that they're supposed to be on time for work. <laughs> so sometimes those simple life skills are so critical and we need to make sure that those are getting incorporated into what's being taught to students. So let's think about assessing another counselor, and this one on standard three. So we'll give you about a minute to read about Miss Casey in reference to standard three that we just talked about. And you also have your handout to look at the expectations for standard three. How would you rate this counselor on standard three? I'm gonna give you a minute to read that and think about how you would rate this counselor. Not quite Ms. Thomason, is she? But she's trying. And if you said developing, you're exactly right. 65% um, of her time on that rotation providing guidance is, is monopolizing her time, basically. Um, and the frequency that she's providing classroom guidance should be based on student needs. So uh, what I see with a lot of elementary counselors is they target those kindergartners at the beginning of the year, and then they look at the needs across the school to see where they need to be doing the most classroom guidance throughout the year, and they make sure to connect with those fifth graders even more so at the end of the year before they go off to middle school. So that's just one example of basing it on student needs. Or maybe if um, you're in middle school and the seventh grade has got some serious bullying going on. So the council might be targeting that grade level a little bit more often um, based on the student needs. 
Also, with the 65% of their time on this rotation, it's not allowing, allowing them sufficient time for other counseling services. Um, the book of classroom guidance lessons that she liked, we would hope that that was also based on what the students needed, because the materials she's using should be based on the student needs. It's really good that Ms. Casey has started trying to integrate topics that teachers are covering in their content areas into her guidance lessons. The more kids can see the same topics popping up from one content area to another, the more they're likely they're going to understand it. So that's a good start, and she needs to continue to develop that. Um, she's designated 45 minutes twice a week for individual counseling from teacher referrals. So is that really enough time and it, is it really based on student needs? So we really want this counselor to do a better job assessing what the student needs are and delivering a comprehensive program that is designed to meet those students' needs so that it removes barriers to learning and the students can be ready to learn and the teacher's not dealing with uh, outside behaviors that are coming from other things that kids are worried about and barriers to learning, but that this counselor has helped remove those barriers so that the teacher can just deal with teaching and students learning. So if you selected developing on that one, you're absolutely right. So on to standard four. Uh, this is more of the counselor promoting learning for all students. And again, you'll see a lot of overlap in some of these standards. They, they do have some differences, but there is some overlap. You'll see things reflected in more than one standard sometimes. So with standard four, the questions you want to ask is, does my school counselor know the influences that affect individual student learning, such as human development, culture, and language proficiency? Because if the counselor is going to be removing those barriers to learning so that kids are ready to learn when they get to the classroom with the teacher, then they need to understand what's influencing those barriers and that learning and understanding how that does impact student learning and help the students overcome it. Uh, providing resources to staff to enhance student strengths and address student weaknesses or needs. Um, using academic behavior and attendance data to plan their appropriate programs. So if you're at a high school, um, you know, the courses are only getting more difficult. If a student has an attendance problem, that's going to become a huge barrier to their being successful in a course. So what is the school counselor doing to help students with attendance or students with behavioral issues? Are they consulting and collaborating with their colleagues, with parents and guardians and other stakeholders? to get needs addressed. Frequently the needs we see our students have, we don't even have the capacity in a school to address them. So we need the counselor and maybe social workers and others reaching out to community resources that can help us address some of those needs. Um, we also want counselors utilizing the guidance curriculum and individual student planning and preventive and responsive services to meet the needs of students to help raise achievement and close gaps and spending the majority of their time on those direct students, uh, direct services that are helping students be ready to learn. Assisting all students in developing academic career and personal social skills. So those are some of the questions you could ask with standard four. A few more. Are they helping students learn problem solving techniques? Um, I think we've probably all encountered this at some point in our lives. I can give you a really simple example. I went to a restaurant once where they said the iced tea maker was broken. I said, well, you have hot tea, right? And the young lady was like, yeah. So I asked her for a glass of ice, a cup of hot water, and a tea bag. She truly had no idea what I was going to do with that. It was as simple as dunking the tea bag in the hot water, pouring it over the ice. We really need to teach kids how to problem solve and think critically on their own. And that, that's a very simple example. But they are going to go out into life. We're preparing them for life. So how are our counselors helping them with the critical thinking skills, um, including when they're with their peers? Um, how are they going to weigh consequences if they're at a party and some other kids are trying to get them to try drugs? So what are counselors doing to help students with critical thinking skills and problem solving skills and helping with a variety of methods to support the academic career? career and personal social development of all students. Um, helping students in developing an effective listening and communication skills. Uh, any of you in a middle school, you know exactly how detrimental it can be when kids don't really listen and communicate well. Something about middle school that really blows up. 
um, and it can happen at any other grade level too. So helping students with those effective listening and communication skills, because that can also help enhance their academic success, their positive relationships with other students and their teachers, resolving conflicts. So what is your counselor doing to help accomplish this for students? So here's another question item. Which of the following would be an effective, appropriate strategy for the school counselor under standard four? Let's take a minute to read each one of these options and decide which you think would be an effective, appropriate strategy for a counselor under standard four. We won't do a poll this time. I'll just go ahead and give you the answer. Hopefully a lot of you thought all of the above. These are all great, great strategies for a school counselor to be using as part of standard four. Again, it comes back to removing barriers to learning and helping kids be ready beyond where they are currently. The last standard is standard five. And this is really about counselors just reflecting on their practice. What, did, what are they doing in their comprehensive school counseling program? So asking, does my school counselor really think systematically and critically about the impact of their program on students' academic career and personal social development? Or are they just kind of flying by the seat of their pants, doing whatever they think looks fun? Um, or are they really systematically and critically thinking about this and looking at the data afterwards to see if it made a difference? I have a colleague that has an excellent example of this. Uh, straight out of college, she couldn't wait to do peer mediators, spent all this time advertising for them and getting the students trained, and had absolutely only one referral that entire school year. Next year, same thing, zero referrals. The data told her that wasn't a good thing in that school. Something wasn't working. So she could have continued to do peer mediators just because she loved it but it wasn't meeting the needs of the students. So she, when she looked at that data, she knew she needed to spend her time somewhere else. So using data to make the determinations, analyzing student achievement and behavior data and school climate data, getting feedback from the students and the parents and other stakeholders as they look to develop their comprehensive school counseling program and evaluating the effectiveness of the program based on data. What is the data telling them? Did those students that were in that test taking skills group really improve their test taking skills? So looking at the data. They also need to be participating in some high quality professional development of their own. So looking at kind of a global view of educational practices to help their students, those 21st century life skills and knowledge, um, especially aligning with your school priorities and your district priorities, uh, looking at your school improvement plan. Um, and meeting the needs of students and their own professional growth and looking into new ideas, not doing the same thing they've done in the classroom or wherever for the last 10 years just because that's what they're used to doing, but really what's working for students to help students be more successful. Everything we've talked about today, um, the large majority of this came out of a module that you can find in Homebase if you want to dig deeper into this. Uh, we wanted to give you a broad overview of this information to, to kind of get you thinking about questions that you can ask of your school counseling program to see if it's effectively supporting uh, student success. But if you would like to dig a little bit deeper, um, a lot of these, uh, even some of the question activities that we did came from this module in Homebase. So you just uh, administrator guide to effective school counseling and evaluation. It is estimated to take approximately five hours if you want to complete the whole module. Um, so, and it is self-paced. So I know carving five hours out when you're an administrator is pretty difficult. But if you can carve out 30 minutes here, 30 minutes there, uh, you could look through this module and get a little bit better understanding of what to look for in a school counseling program to make sure it's making a strong positive difference for your students. The questions uh, that we use today are in a downloadable document 
within this module. There's also a sample artifacts list. Um, lots of things you can download within the module, even action plan templates for your school counselors to use in making uh, strategic plans for how to address student needs. So lots of things you can download in that module. To access it, you simply go into Home Base, click the Professional Development tab. You can either search Administrator Guide to Effective School Counseling and Evaluation or click on so, so, uh, Show All, excuse me. Um, with it beginning with the A, it's pretty close to the top of the list. And again, just want to make sure you knew about this in case you did want to take a look at it and download any of the resources that are in there. Um, there is also a school counselor version of this. It's a lot longer, but it kind of holds their hand through implementing all these stra uh, standards that we just talked about. Uh, if you're not don't have time to go in the module right now, but still want those reflective questions that we went through, and, and there's additional reflective questions um, also, you can go to the School Counseling Wiki, and on the School Counselor Standards and Evaluation page, there's a downloadable document of the reflective questions similar to what we just went through. It will actually have a, a yes, yes, no column where you can check whether or not the counselor is doing that. Uh, something else that's on this page that a lot of administrators have asked for is a list of sample appropriate observation opportunities. So we know that's kind of difficult sometimes when you're used to observing teachers. You go in their classroom, you observe them teach. It's a little bit harder for counseling. They do such a variety of things, and so much of it is not done in the classroom. So there's a sample list there to help you with how you can observe school counselors. Sometimes you have to observe the artifacts. Um, like a minute ago, I mentioned career day. So you can actually observe career day, but you can also look for the artifacts that the counselor used to plan career day. Did they have a handout or something for students, for students to ask questions during career day? So that's just one example. So there's lots of resources on this uh, page if you want to look at those. The general statute, if you scroll down on the page, you can also find that duties of school counselors statute on there. Something else that we're working on and almost finished with, this probably looks familiar to you. It's fairly new, but on the NESIS wiki, and it's questions for post-observation, conference, and summit evaluation with teachers. We are uh, in the process of creating one like this for school counselors, and we hope to have that ready for you very soon. Uh, so be looking for that, and it will be on the NESIS wiki. Speaking of the NESIS wiki, um, this webinar has been recorded, so you can um, access it under the 2017-18 webinars on the NESIS Wiki. And I was so worried about running out of time. It looks like we have got plenty of time for questions, so I'm, I'm glad for that. So, uh, Kim, if you want to jump in with anything or if we have any questions, I don't know if you and Delia were taking down questions as we went along or if anyone wants to raise questions now. Thanks, Cynthia. We um, we answered a few questions. So I answered a few questions throughout the webinar, and Delia may have as well. But we did have the question on where can we find this presentation later, and you covered that. And we also sent out the link uh, to everyone, uh, letting them know, to, to the exact page, the archived webinars page there, where you see the red arrow. And of course, you can always go to the front page of the NESIS Wiki and choose where you see the red arrow, um, and look at the other archived webinars, including this one as well. But this was a great webinar. Um, I always learn something when I listen to you and I hear your examples, and I think the activities and the polls were um, were fantastic today, and I love the examples, and I'm, I'm sure this is going to be beneficial to everyone. So a big thank you to you um, for, for all that you put into this presentation. Absolutely, and, and I see someone has asked a question about have, have a similar training been offered to school counselors, um, yet we do lots of training with counselors a lot. Um, it's getting a little bit difficult to do trainings on the standards because we're finding a lot of counselors are at different points, which is part of why we created the module in home base because I do a professional development needs survey at the end of each school year, and um, when it comes to about the standards and the ASCA national model, I get anything from, why are you still asking us? We've been doing this for years, to people saying they very much need professional development on it. So the same module that I showed you all is available for school administrators. There's a much lengthier version of that module for school counselors in home base. 
Um, a matter of fact, it is worth three CEUs. It is so lengthy. Uh, they're, they're kind of forewarned, this is going to take you a while. But that's because it, it pretty much holds their hand through analyzing their school data and how to take that data and make an action plan of a counseling service to provide in their school and at implementing that comprehensive school counseling program. And it starts out giving them kind of an overview of the ASCA national model and then a review of the standards and the review of the evaluation process. And their module culminates with having them implement all of that. So there's lots of activities in there. Again, it's worth three CEU, so it's a pretty lengthy module. So um, that is out there available for school counselors. And um, there's also a school counseling wiki space, like I, I showed you one page of that where you can download the questions document and the observations document. There are a lot of resources and archived um, webinars and things for counselors uh, on that page too. And I see someone has asked, um, are they self-paced? Yes, the modules are self-paced. Um, I've had some school district level administrators that supervise school counseling um, ask me about possibly doing something district-wide with this, and you could very easily do that if your district was interested. Um, you have like deadlines of complete this section by this date, maybe take a semester or however long you want to to complete the module, but yes, it is self-paced, so there's really crazy busy times of year. They, they can wait and get back to it, and those are uh, less crazy times, like 2 a.m. on Sunday, I think it's about the only time we're not busy, uh, they can uh, put more time into it. I think the um, module would be fantastic for uh, new counselors and our master counselors as well, Cynthia. I think it's a great resource. And you could simply include it on the on the PDP, right? Yes. And uh, a yeah. and matter of fact, um, I don't know how many of you all have heard about the recognized Ask a Model program. It's called the RAMP Award. We also kept that in mind as we built the school counselor module so that if you're interested in your school getting the RAMP award, that module will help them prepare for that because we look, kept looking at the, the RAMP rubric as we develop materials in that module because, again, our state standards are very much aligned with the American School Counselor standards. Um, and the, the RAMP award is not easy to get. It takes about a year to pull the application together, but it is quite an honor. Um, so there's more information out there about that. Your school counselor could probably get you more information or you're welcome to email me. But that module can help get your school the RAMP award too if you're interested. And we actually, we're fourth in the nation for the most schools with RAMP awards. So another bragging right for North Carolina. <laughs> that is, uh, that's exceptional. Uh, we have another question. Cynthia, do you see it? What do you say to administration about scheduling counselors in the rotation when they say, but we need them for teachers to have common planning? Are you there, Cynthia? Hearing from some folks is the class size reduction legislation is also imp impacting this um, as administrators try to juggle making K-3 classes smaller with the loss of possibly smart music phys ed teachers. And I do know that is a difficult struggle. Uh, we're not saying this is an easy thing to do. So I, I point blank ask a school administrator, how do you make this work? Because it was school administrator at elementary school. And she basically told me, I consider my school counselor time just as valuable and I want my school counselor planning with the teachers. So uh, the legislation requires that you try to get the teachers at planning time, and we do want teachers to have that planning time. It doesn't require that they get a solid hour or more every single day. So what that administrator was doing is they got the common planning time, but it wasn't every single day. Um, 
another thing she said that sometimes their their planning time together might be before or after school on the um, if they didn't have enough planning time during the week. Uh, another thing that I do want to caution you with that um, locked in schedule, because part of the concern is having the counselor locked into the schedule, is that should you have a student in crisis and the counselor is not allowed to help that student with their crisis because they're locked into a classroom rotation, you have a potential liability issue if you say got accredited because with a school counselor or you've told your staff that then your parents that there's a counselor available but then the counselor wasn't available and something traumatic happens to the student there is a potential liability there if the counselor is not available so if you do have to lock them into that rotation uh, I do recommend that you make sure teachers know that a child in crisis uh, takes priority over a classroom guidance schedule um, I've also heard from some counselors that are saying they're no longer able to get to the professional development they need as well as they used to because they're locked into a rotation. Um, so I just really advise you to be cautious how stringently that you lock counselors into those schedules because it, it does cause additional problems in getting the counseling services to students. If there's not an easy answer. Um, there's a lot I'd like to say, but as you know, as state employees, uh, we can't talk about legislators. <laughs> uh, the legislators are doing a lot of great things for us, but um, it would be great if they could see these concerns and, and recognize the need we have for their support too.